here we go. Chapter two, we're going to be talking about the well-being of the EMT. Some of the topics we will be talking about. Well-being, your personal protection. We're going to talk about disease of concerns, emotions and stress, and scene safety. We'll be going over all these in this chapter. We're going to start off with well-being. Uh, it's very important that you keep yourself prepared for the demands and risk of EM EMT, right? Uh, it is a very demanding job at times, and it can be risky, uh, but we try to make these risks very minimal. Um, and if you're unable to function, if you're not mentally and physically fit um, or hurt or injured for some reason, then you're not going to be able to take care of anybody else. So we have to take care of you first. Maintaining well-being. It's important to maintain solid personal relationships. And what I mean by that is you have to have those solid relationships to where you could go back and talk to people about bad calls that's going to help you and understand you, you know, your spouse, your co-workers, um, especially if your spouse is a co-worker. Uh, that individual knows exactly what you're going through. So you have to maintain these good personal relationships. It's always a good idea to exercise, keep in good shape. We, we need to sleep. Proper sleep is very good. I, I understand that we don't always get that in EMS, but it's, sleep is very important. You should want to eat right as well. Again, not always achievable in EMS. Uh, we're always on the run, and sometimes the only chance you have to eat is 3 o'clock in the morning, you're eating gas station food, so it may not be the healthiest choice. But to maintain a well-being, you should try to make better choices. We're going to limit our alcohol and caffeine. I know you're probably laughing because it's, it's a joke that EMS is fueled on caffeine and nicotine. Uh, but it's in order to get like proper sleep and stuff like that, you should maintain a lower caffeine intake. And alcohol, too, is, is not the best choice sometimes. And we should see our physician on a regular basis and keep up with up-to-date vaccines. Personal protection, right? We're going to start talking about the standard precaution. We're going to start talking about pathogens. Pathogens are organisms that cause infection. Now, these pathogens can be either airborne or bloodborne, right? These are the little microorganisms that can make you sick. Uh, standard precaution will include steps to protect you from these pathogens, which would include, like, our first step is our PPE, or personal protection equipment, which we will talk about here in a minute. And we're going to make decisions about what standard precaution to use based on what patient we're seeing. We may need the minimum standard of precaution of just gloves on patients. And then the next patient may be uh, a, a bleeding patient, so we're going to go with more precaution, maybe put a face shield on, a, a gown, you know, next patient may be vomiting, so you want to put a mask on them, a face shield. Uh, it, it's individual based per patient. Uh, OSHA, or the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has issued strict guidelines about what precautions we use against exposure to blood pathogens, right? Most places you go to work for will require you to do an annual or a yearly um, bloodborne pathogen training. Um, and it's pretty much the same training every year, but it's, it's a good uh, review each year about bloodborne pathogens and how we take precautions against it. And you're going to refer to your local protocols when wearing personal protective equipment, right? Uh, written policies also address what to do in the event of exposure. These are your exposure uh, policies, uh, usually written by your management and maybe even your system coordinator you know, on up to that level. So here's a nice picture of some generalized PPE. As you notice, you got some gloves there. You got several different masks. You got masks with shields built in and you got eye protection. Let's start talking about that PPE or uh, personal protective equipment. You also hear it sometimes referred to BSI or body substance isolation. Uh, those are interchangeable terms, PPE and BSI. Depends on what book you're learning out of and your instructor. So um, it, just, just know that's the same term. So we'll start off with the very basic, your gloves, right? 
They're going to be vinyl or other non-latex. Um, they have went to nitrate now is most of your gloves. Um, so that's what you're going to have for gloves. Gloves should be changed between patients. Um, let's back up. What's, gloves should be worn on every patient. And then you should change your gloves if you're going to see more than one patient. It's also a good idea and a little trick that if you're going to uh, an incident that may have more than one patient, it's to put on multiple gloves. You know, if I go to one patient, after I get done with that patient and I move on to the next, I can take off the outer layer of gloves and I have clean gloves underneath, right? And you want to wear heavy-duty and tear-resistant gloves when you're cleaning the ambulance or soil equipment. You don't rip your glove and get exposed when you're cleaning your ambulance. Here they're showing proper way to remove your gloves. Um, if you take a class uh, in class classroom, you will practice this, but you're going to pull down on your one glove. I usually use my, I'm right-handed, so I'll pull down the top of my left glove, and as it comes down, I'll fold it inside that, fold it inside out, and I'll wad it up my hand, and before you get it all the way off, however, you're going to reach through and you're going to grab the other glove off. I think that's the next slide. Nope, no, it's not. But you're, you're, the whole point is you're not ever touching the outside of those gloves with exposed skin. Hand cleaning is the number one best practice to prevent the spread of any infectious disease. It's hand washing. You're vigorous washing the hands with soap and water. Uh, they say a minimum of 30 seconds or sing the happy birthday song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, you know, that song. And that's about 30 seconds long. If you don't have access to soap and water right away, uh, you can use an al alcohol-based hand cleaner. But this alcohol-based hand cleaner um, should be used only when soap and water is not available. And then once you get access to soap and water, go ahead and wash your hands, okay? Here they're showing you careful uh, methodic hand washing is effective in reducing exposure, what I just said. But here they're showing the alcohol base or the hand sanitizer. Eye protection, face protection. Uh, eye protection will prevent from splattering or splashing or any type of spraying body fluids. Um, should provide a guard on both the front and side. So if you're like me and have to wear pre uh, prescription eyeglasses, these are not class or not uh, eye protection. So you have to either wear something over them or goggles, whatever. Unless you have the side shields, they are not good eye protection. Mask. Uh, we all went through the COVID era, so we're all very familiar with masks. Uh, in cases where there's going to be blood or fluid splatter, wear a surgical mask. In cases where you're going to have suspicion of like TB or some infective disease that's airborne, you may want to go to uh, an N95 or a HEPA filter, something that's going to protect you a little more. Uh, face shields offer protection of the entire face. Now, um, these come in different varieties. Uh, they can come from the slide up like welding helmets, things that you see. Or they could be just something you just put on and throw away afterwards. Here's a good picture of, this is an N95 worn face, or I'm sorry, eye protection or safety glasses. Wear protective mask and face shield when you're suctioning, right? Because that patient could vomit again, or you can get everywhere so you want to protect your, your, your face. Gown, sometimes... You have to gown up if you have like something that's got a real bloody situation or your patient's projectile vomiting or whatever, uh, you want to wear a gown. Gowns may also may also wear a gown to protect clothing and bare skin from spills and splashes. It says wear gowns if a patient has arterial bleed during childbirth or has multiple injuries. Uh, very early on during the COVID era, uh, we were gowning up on every patient. So even during the COVID, stuff like that, we were gowning up. Let's talk about diseases a little bit. Um, hep B and Hep C. There is also another one called Hep A, which you only get by 
uh, contaminated feces. So especially like in a nursing home setting, someone who would have a and you go clean their bottom up or whatever and don't go wash your hands and go eat, you can't be exposed to hep A. But hep B and hep C are infections that cause inflammation to the liver. Um, they can live on a dried surface for several days. I've heard and seen research that says that hep B can survive 14 days dried up and then it can be reactivated by a drop of water. Okay, so kind of scary stuff. Hep B or HBV is very deadly, it kills hundreds of healthcare workers each year uh, before the vaccine was available. And any company that you go to work for via ambulance, hospital, wherever in, in this healthcare industry has to offer you the, the Hep B vaccine. Now you have the right to, to deny or not get this vaccine, but they have to offer it. Now with Hep C, there is no vaccine yet, and it poses some risk, but it's not as risky as, as Hep B is. Now we're gonna talk about TB or tuberculosis. It's an infection of the lung, very highly contagious, and it's airborne. Um, this was once thought to be er eradicated. Uh, they thought they had wiped it out completely until the early 80s, it started coming back around. Now, um, there are specialty centers that take care of TB patients, but it's not as you don't see it on a daily basis like like other ailments. So, um, but it is out there, and you should be aware of what it is, and that, that know that it's highly contagious. So, if you're going to be taking care of someone, you're going to be masked up. They're going to be masked up. We'll be talking about that later in this section. AIDS or HIV. Uh, AIDS starts with HIV. It attacks your uh, immune system, leaving the patient unable to fight off infection. Um, so you get exposed to HIV. Um, it lays dormant for a certain period of time. It could be 10 years or you can never get AIDS. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get AIDS if you're exposed to HIV. AIDS is a set of conditions that results when the immune system has been attacked by HIV, right? Um, although there's no cure, they have came a long way and they ha are able to manage AIDS and HIV pretty good now. Uh, AIDS is a lower risk to healthcare provider than what hepatitis or TB is. Um, contact of blood is the usual route of infection. There are other routes of infection, you know, it's sexually transmitted, uh, but bloodborne is the usual route for infection for healthcare providers. All right, now we're gonna talk about Ebola. Ebola was discovered in Africa in the 1970s. Uh, it, the first known case in the United States was 2014. It's a hemorrhagic fever, which means it attacks your clotting system in your body and you won't be able to clot. Um, it starts off like flu-like symptoms, um, watery diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, vomiting, fever, stuff like that. And it ends up where you end up dying by like internal bleeds. It's a big one, external bleeds. You'll start seeing bruising, high rate of deaths and lack of definitive treatment. There ain't a whole lot they can do for it once you contract this, right? Uh, and then we're going to talk about specific diseases of concern like SARS. We're all kind of familiar with SARS now because COVID-19 is a SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome and it's spread through respiratory droplets. Someone coughing is a big one. Uh, but one way that it can spread is someone coughs in her hand and goes talk, touches the door handle and you touch that door handle and then go rub your mouth, face or your mouth or your eye and you get exposed to it, right? Uh, another one is MERS, the Mid-Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And this is found primarily in the Arabian Peninsula or the Middle East. Okay, the avarian flu or the bird flu, right? We all heard about the bird flu. It was uh, uh, epidemic or not an epidemic, but it was concerning at one point in time. Uh, it's found in poultry. It can be transmitted to humans but it's not easily transmittable from human to human. So it's not super contagious from human to human, but you can get it from poultry, especially like chicken or turkeys. 
Uh, we're going to start talking about the influenza. Uh, it's been around for hundreds of years, right? In 1918, the pandemic killed 30 to 50 million people worldwide. That was before we started vaccinating for it. And the big ones are influenza A and B. We still see that all the time, especially people that are high risk, like the old and the young, right? The older really, and the pediatric patients. But people that also have a weakened immune system, like our HIV patients, or our AIDS patients, or people that have like lupus that have an autoimmune, they're at higher risk for these diseases as far as having uh, bad outcomes, like dying from it or whatever. So uh, everybody will probably get the flu. Um, there are vaccines that you can get annually with uh, what they are predicting to be the flus of that uh, year. Infection control in the law. EMS personnel and other health providers are at high risk of coming to contact with infection disease. This is a true statement, right? Because people are sick. That's why they call an ambulance. So we are at high risk of being in contact, right? Guidelines for workplace safety developed by OSHA and the CDC. So we are always constantly uh, looking at these guidelines and make sure we're following them and so forth. Uh, so the OSHA standard on bloodborne pathogen requires infectious control to be a joint responsibility of the employer and employee, right? So not only is the employer responsible for training you, EMSA needs to provide training. They have to give protective equipment, which is your PPE. You know, our ambulances are equipped with all this. And they have to offer vaccines to the employees. For example, the hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, and employees can participate in the infectious exposure control plan. And it is your job. If you get exposed, you have to report that to your supervisor. And then he'll put in place this exposure plan, which means you'll probably go into the hospital and get some blood drawn on several occasions. Uh, adequate education training. Uh, they have to offer the vaccine like I just talked about. Personal protective equipment. Method of control. Housekeeping, you know, they're going to train you and tell you the best methods to clean your animals after you have, you know, certain calls. Uh, labeling and post-exposure evaluation follow-up. That's what I talked about, that if you get exposed to certain things, you'll probably go to the hospital and get blood drawn, like right after it happens, maybe a couple days later, maybe a month later, and so forth and so on. Ryan White Care Act. Okay, this is an important act. Um, it's in your book, and I definitely would suggest you read this entire section. But it allows EMS providers to find out if they may have been exposed to potentially life-threatening diseases while providing care. Ryan White was a teenager who got exposed to HIV accidentally and didn't know it. And then later on in the 90s, I think he died from AIDS. So his family got together with some congressmen, and they passed this act so that you have the right to know. Uh, designated officers gathers facts about potential exposures, right? So usually someone in your department is a designated officer and he will be gathering all this facts and information about exposures. Uh, there's two different notification systems in play with this Ryan White Act, the airborne disease exposure and the bloodborne or infectious disease exposure. Uh, once notified of exposure, employees will refer you to the healthcare professionals for evaluation and follow-up. Usually the ER, uh, they have an exposure plan, most hospitals do, uh, that is set forth by them and your employer, and they and that's where you'll be doing your testing. They'll be doing drone labs, like I said, usually right after an exposure, maybe a day or two later, maybe a month later, maybe a year later, maybe five years later. Whatever you're exposed to, they have a plan set up and your follow-up. The tuberculosis compliance mandate, right? OSHA respiratory standards, selective use of respirator. So you have to wear an N95 or a HEPA mask when you are caring for a patient who has or suspected of having TB. While you're transporting individuals from such a setting in the closed vehicle, like in an ambulance. So if we're taking them not only from hospital to hospital or hospital long-term care, if we know this patient has TB and we're transporting them from like their home 
we'll put an N95 on and we'll make sure that the patient has at least a uh, surgical mask on, right? Uh, we're going to perform high risk procedures such as, in, when performing high risk procedures such as endial suction or intubation, which intubation is out of your scope, but or, all this, and so is the suctioning, the endotracheal suctioning. So this won't apply to you, but it's nice knowledge to know that if you're in the back of an ALS ambulance and your partner, who is a paramedic or an advanced EMT, is performing an, uh, an, if they're going to intubate them, that you need an N95 on. All right, let's talk about some immunizations, right? Uh, you can have immunization for Hep B. Um, this will have to be available through your emergency EMS agency. Usually your health departments, you'll go there. Uh, they are paid for by your employer. So it is like a three shot series. You take one, you come back, I think a month later, maybe two months later, take a second one and repeat it on the third one. Uh, your regular TV testing may also be required. Uh, some places require an annual TV testing. And you just have to learn your local system protocols and how they vary on what immunizations you have to have. Some places require that you have to have certain uh, immunizations. Some places, like, for example, hospital settings, may require you to take a flu shot each year. So that is employer-based, and that will be under their direction. All right, let's start talking a little bit about emotions and stress. Psychological aspects of stress. Stress is inevitable in the EMS profession. It's inevitable in, in everyday life, right? We can't avoid stress. It's there, it's out there, we can't avoid it. But we need to learn to recognize the signs of stress and develop a strategy to deal with it, right? It's very important in the EMS career. Not only for ourselves, but we have to recognize it on our coworkers too. Uh, EMS has a high suicide rate for, and it's it's gone down in the recent years because of this. We're, we recognize that one's in trouble, a uh, little stressed out or whatever, and we get them the help they need. You're going to see this term resilience or toughness. This is something you develop the more you work in EMS, and it's your ability to overcome tough situations. Uh, it helps EMS riders deal with difficult situations, and you are going to have difficult calls. Um, it, you know, we're only human, so we are going to have calls that bother us. So this resilience, you start to build a resilience against them and help you be able to deal with these stuff. This would include stress being physical and mental, uh, including, I'm sorry, includes understanding stress, being physical and mental, mentally able to respond and using techniques mentally to proceed in difficult scenes. All right, there are three different stages we see in the stress, right? You have the first stress, which is the arming reaction. That's your fight or flight. That's when your pupils dilate, your heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, your digestive tract slows down, your bronchi and your or bronchi tubes in your lungs expand so you get more oxygen. This is the fight or flight. Second stage is the stage of resistance. This is when you 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 deal with the stress, meet the stress, and you start coping with it, and you start coming down. Your body starts neutralizing or coming back to normal. A third stage of stress is total exhaustion, where you lose the ability to resist or adapt to the stressor. This is not a good stage, and this is the one that we need to recognize that we're either we're having trouble or our coworkers are in trouble. Uh, may occur result of a critical incident. And we will go into that here in a bit. Any situation that triggers a strong emotional response can cause stress. Uh, often like a uh, catastrophe, um, acute stress. This is acute. This is not prolonged exposure. This is something that happens right now, right? Signs and symptoms develop sooner after the incident. Physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavior symptoms, right? We, we can have... Physical, we can literally physically start having chest pain or breathing problems. Cognitive, we may not be thinking clearly or not concentrating. Emotional, we can start just crying for no reason. Or we can start having behavioral symptoms, you know, like we're angry all the time. Normal reaction to extraordinary situations. So this is normal, some of this. 
It's when it gets excessive when it's not normal. May require professional intervention. Sometimes you need to talk to somebody more than a coworker, a boss, a family member. You need to talk to someone who's trained in this to help you through it. Now let's talk about delayed stress reaction. This one of the big ones is the PTSD or the post-traumatic stress disorder. Signs and symptoms may not happen right away. It may be long after the incident and to the point we don't even know what triggered it, right? Delay makes dealing with this reaction much harder because, like I said, we may not even know uh, what's causing the problem. And this will more than likely require intervention by mental health professional, someone who's trained to take care of this, not your normal paramedic or coworker or boss, someone like a psychiatrist or a sociologist or a counselor. Cumulative stress reaction, that's where we get into the burnout level. This is just a result of years of sustaining low level stressors, right? Day after day after day, and you'll reach this burnout level. Now, my opinion, I don't think burnout is permanent. I think it is with some people, but for most people, we hit a burnout level. Um, for some reason, we, we take a break from it or uh, take a vacation, relax for a while, we come back, and we're, we're, we're kind of come out of that stage. But that doesn't mean we don't go in and out of it. Early signs, uh, vague anxiety. Uh, we're boredom. We, you know, we're just bored all the time. Emotionally exhausted. Oops. Uh, progresses to physical complaints, loss of emotional control, irritability, depression. Irritability is a big one, right? These are those old, angry paramedics that's been on the job for years, right? This is the, a sign of burnout. May present a severe withdrawal or suicidal thoughts requiring long-term psychiatric intervention. Yes, these people are definitely going to need uh, some intervention, and this is why our suicide rate is so high. Causes of stress, right? These could be both acute and long-term, but uh, MCIs, big car crashes or um, mass casualty incidences, calls involving children, of course, or infants. Nobody likes to see a sick or hurt child. Uh, nobody likes to see anybody hurt or, or sick, but children especially. Uh, severe injuries can cause stress. Abuse and neglect definitely will cause stress and death of a coworker. Uh, signs and symptoms. There are two different stresses. There's the e-stress, which is a positive form of stress, right? This is what helps you to work under pressure and respond effectively. Then there's the negative side of the bad stress called distress. This is causing immediate or long-term problems with your health and well-being. If you don't do something about it, it just keeps getting worse. Signs and symptoms of stress. Irritability, we talked about earlier. Inability to concentrate. Changes in your day activities, anxiety, indecisiveness, uh, guilt, isolation, loss of interest in work, right? You hate your job. Uh, you just want to be left alone. Um, these are all good signs of stress. Dealing with stress. How are we going to deal with the stress, right? We can't just quit our jobs. Uh, we got into this profession because we wanted to help people. Um, and it is a profession. It is a job on most for most people, and we usually just can't afford to quit it. So how are we going to deal with this? One of the things we can do is lifestyle changes, develop a more healthy and positive dietary habits, exercise, devote time to relax, don't work as many hours if you can avoid it. You know, take, take, take a vacation if you have some time. You may have to change shift or even location for a lighter call volume, uh, maybe different uh, different call types, uh, more family time. The invisible wounds, remember, preventing psychological trauma. <coughs> psychological traumas can result from tragic traumatic scenes. Tra uh, systems that take in stimulation from a traumatic incident may malfunction, right? Um, and also remember, you're not the only one that can see the psych psychological trauma. This can happen to patients and bystanders. We have to remember that as well. Uh, preventing if physical, I'm sorry, preventing psychological trauma. We use the acronym SCAPE. Uh, every patient, right? Social support. Sometimes it helps get uh, 
support from our peers, our family, choices and controls, anticipate what's going to happen, plan and organize, and every time. Use this method every time. Uh, sometimes you get a big, like an MCI or a, a death of a child or other issues, and you have critical incident stress management. It's a comprehensive system. Includes education response to prevent stress and ways to deal with the stress. And one of the ways you deal with it is these CISDs or critical incident stress debriefings. They're designed to help or diffuse. It's a debriefing after incident. Now, this will also include anybody that was involved in a call a lot of times. Uh, not only EMS, you'll have fire, you'll have police, you'll have personnel from the hospital, whatever. Um, They'll have these debriefings. It's a team of trained peer counselors and mental health professionals will meet with the rescuers and healthcare providers, and it should be done 24 to 72 hours after the incident. And it helps responders deal with stress. And I personally have sat through a few of these, and I will tell you they are very helpful. It's kind of nice to know that that I'm not the only one that's thinking the. Uh, you know, feeling these feelings or thinking these thoughts. So it's nice to be able to debrief after that. And they really, really work. Uh, now we're going to start talking about dealing with stress and understanding death, right? Emotional stages. There are five stages to uh, um, dying and uh, death and dying. The first one is denial. You know, it's not me. I'm not dying. This isn't true. Then they go into the anger stage. Why me? You know, they're kind of pissed off about this. Why am I dying? Uh, or why did that person die? Um, then you're going to bargain. Okay. Uh, it's okay that I'm dying, but first let me see little Jimmy graduate high school or whatever. You know, it's a bargaining stage. Following the bargaining goes into depression. Uh, they can get very depressed. And then the, the final stage is acceptance okay this ain't so bad i know it's happening right now this doesn't mean that people that are dying or people that have died and people that are dealing with it go through all five stages uh they normally do and they and we never know how long they progress you know they could be in denial state for a long time then then shoot right from the denial right through the next three and go right into acceptance you know uh so we never know how long each stage is going to last uh, recognize the patient's need. Uh, we realize that the patient dies and the patient needs, and so we need to recognize it. Be tolerant of anger, angry reactions from the patient or family, right? Uh, they're going through those stages of grief like we just talked about, and one of those stages is anger, so we have to be tolerant of this. We have to listen with empathy, um, and we don't want to give false reassurance or false hopes. We're not going to tell them everything's going to be all right if we know and they know it's not going to be all right, so don't be giving them false reassurances. Offer as much comfort as you realistically you can give. Sometimes that's the best medicine is just to hold a hand, you know, and, and be there for that patient. Let's talk about scene safety. It's very important. EMS is not usually a dangerous profession. It's not because of certain safety protocols and issues we put into play. Be aware of potential dangers is always a priority. We'll talk about this more when we start talking about assessment, but we talk about the windshield survey or the dashboard survey as we're pulling up or looking for dangers from the very beginning. Like, for example, pets, dogs, um, what shape is the house in? It, you know, is the car stabilized? Stuff like that. We're looking for potential dangers. We're going to determine if the scene is safe. And we'll, is, we're determining scene safety will be the most important decision on any call. Every call starts with scene safety. If it's not safe, we as EMS providers are not going in that scene. Uh, so it always starts with scene safety. Uh, hazardous material incidents. We're, we're not, this is just going to be a brief overview. There is a chapter in this book that will go more in depth, right? Our uh, primary role is to maintain safe distance from the source of hazard. That's our role, right, as EMS providers, is to recognize 
more than anything. And how we're going to recognize is placards. Um, we'll go into that in greater detail in later chapters, but ensures that your emergency vehicle is equipped with binoculars so we can look at these placards. And we're going to coordinate with these placards with our ERG, or Emergency Response Guide, a little orange book. Each ambulance or should or responding vehicle should have one in it. Our roles in has, hazmat incident is recognized, right? We're going to recognize, we're going to take action for personal safety and safety of others, and we're going to notify the trained personnel to come and take care of it, which is usually your fire departments. They're their hazmat teams. They're the ones that's going to take care of this. And we're not going to treat any patient until they have undergone decaminate, decontamination, because guess what happens if you put a contaminated patient in your ambulance? You now along with the ambulance, are contaminated. It can't be used until it's been decontaminated. So you can't help anybody else or do anything else until you're de decommed. Here's a good picture. Police officer using binoculars to look out, look at the placards and to figure out what's going on, right? To identify the hazard. Uh, again, terrorist uh, activity or incidents. We're, there is a chapter in this book talking about terrorism, so we'll, we'll go into great detail. But uh, just for a brief overview, just know that it can be small or on a large scale. It may include chemical agents, biological, radiation, weapons, or other explosive devices. These are the weapons of mass destruction. Rescue operations are performed by trained personnel, right? Rescuing or disentangling victims from fire, auto collisions, explosions, electrocutions, and more. Our job is to evaluate each situation and ensure the appropriate assistance is required early. Uh, we're not going to do it unless you're properly trained and properly equipped. And in most instances, EMS or the ambulance side, we are not. This is usually done, again, by rescue uh, teams, usually uh, composed by fire departments. Fire departments are usually your rescue teams. Uh, the realities of well-being. In some situations, you will, help. you will have to make calculated decisions between helping, helping a patient or your personal safety, right? So when it comes down to it, if the scene's not safe, we can't help anybody if we get injured or killed. So your personal safety is number one. So sometimes you have to make that decision not to go into a scene. Uh, knowing that despite your best efforts, some patient will die no matter what we do, how we do it, how, whatever we do, patients are still going to die. And this is just something you're going to have to uh, get used to. Scene safety and well-being are determined by the decisions you make under pressure. Violence, all right, the plan, wear protective or wear safety clothes. Uh, prepare your equipment so it's not co so cumbersome. So if you have to make a quick uh, uh, escape, you don't want all this equipment to hold you back, right? Carry a portable radio and decide on safety roles. We're going to observe. We're going to survey the scene on approach. We talked about that windshield survey or dashboard survey. So we're going to check for the scene on approach. Do not announce your arrival. Turn off your lights and sirens on a violent scene. We're not going to let everybody know that we're coming if it's a violent scene, like psychological calls. We'll be looking for violence. We'll be looking for crime scene, alcohol or drug use, any type of weapons family members, bystanders, uh, and pets. Uh, you don't want to stand directly in front of the door when knocking or ringing a doorbell. As you see here, they look like a, you know, like a police would do it. They stand to the side, not right in front of it. Uh, reaction to danger, the three R's, you're going to respond, uh, which is usually you're going to evacuate or get out into the area and get behind cover. You radio, you're going to radio dispatch and let them know what's going on so they can send help, more than likely police. And you're going to reevaluate. Do not re enter the scene until it has been secured. Uh, and you're never going to enter a scene that is potentially violent until police have secured it and told you it's safe, correct? Uh, most of the time, uh, dispatch is really good at their job and j just by off the 911 call. They will send police on certain calls. The police will get there. We will stage as EMS providers. 
they'll go in and secure and make sure the scene is safe. And then they'll call for you to go in and do your job. Here we go. We're, we're going to flee, get rid of any equipment, right? And take cover and conceal yourself. If it comes down to your equipment or you, leave the equipment. We can replace it. Uh, so leave your equipment, get cover, conceal yourself, and radio for help. Here's a nice picture of it. They're concealed, but they're still close enough that when they, they're needed, they're there. Let's review a little bit. Your well-being is, is an important concept. Uh, this chapter has provided several ways to protect and maintain it. You should never take safety or standard precaution lightly. Uh, each yields are an important decision you will make at least once at each scene you respond to and always. And like I said before, we wear the minimum standard on every patient, which is your gloves. Protect yourself from violence and seen hazards at all costs and protect yourself from disease. To do, but don't get paranoid about catching disease, but take appropriate precautions, right? Just know that you will be exposed and there's a difference between being exposed and contaminated. So we will talk about that later. Resilience means a toughness or ability to recover quickly from a difficult situation. It's important for all EMTs to uh, remain physical and mentally strong. If, you, if you're not physically or mentally strong and can't help, you will not be able to help other people. So you won't be able to do your job properly. Stress may be immediate reaction from a particular call or it can be a cumul cumul uh, cumulative from con combination of life and EMS both. Both kinds are bad for you. Seek help if needed. You will see death and react to death. Each is very personal to, to the to those involved. The stages of death and denial. The stages of death are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and, and acceptance. Uh, treat people who are under stress fairly and compassionately, even if it's difficult to do so. Uh, 